It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 75, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Holy cow, 75 episodes? That feels like a lot. Thank you for all of your support over this last year and a half. It's been a lot of fun so far. Jack Adine, my guest today, he owns Featherstone Farm in Rushford, Minnesota. Farming 132 acres of certified organic vegetables, that's out of a total of 250 planted acres, Featherstone Farm provides around $2 million of produce directly to stores, restaurants, and distributors in Minnesota's Twin Cities, to a produce warehouse in Chicago, and to 900-plus summer CSA shares in addition to seasonal add-ons. Featherstone Farm got its start 20 years ago on five acres in a narrow valley in the bluff country of southeast Minnesota, before devastating floods and continuing growth pushed the farm to relocate to flatter ground in the midst of an industrial park. Jack shares his lessons learned about land selection and farm location, from soil conditions and airflow to logistics and transportation. We delve into Featherstone's distribution system as well, which includes using hired semi-trailers to move produce 100 miles from the farm to the Twin Cities and a fleet of their own trucks and cross-docking arrangements to get the produce to the final customer. It creates all kinds of really interesting challenges and, and really prompted Featherstone as they were looking at this to really do some thinking about how they grow. And so Jack also shares how after years of running the farm on intuition and duct tape, they worked to create systems to run the farm. We get into the nuts and bolts of how Featherstone Farm has structured and documented standard operating procedures, policies, and goals to make the farm work, and the paper-based systems they use to manage their day-to-day operations. It was a lot of fun to reconnect with my old friend Jack Adine from Featherstone Farm. I think you're going to get a lot out of this episode. Jack has a lot to say about really treating your farm like a business, and really thinking about it as something that's more than just about growing vegetables. Hope you enjoy the show. Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. Jack Hadeen, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'd love it if you could start off, Jack, by telling us about Featherstone Farm, where you guys are located how much, how many vegetables you're growing, you know, all of those, that good meaty statistics, you know, your, your calling card for other farmers. Yep. The big picture. So, um, we are lo- Featherstone fruits and vegetables. We're located in, in Southeast Minnesota and bluff country of Southeast Minnesota, uh, Fillmore County. And, um, we are renting, uh, in aggregate about 250 acres. And, uh, in a given year we plant 130 to 135 acres in that range of all fresh market certified organic vegetables, um, range of varieties, although we have been reducing variety uh, numbers and, and, and uh, range of crops over the years. We still grow 20, 30 different crops, I would guess. Um, and um, we're marketing our crops through a CSA program throughout Southeast Minnesota, Twin Cities Metro. We're marketing through food co-ops, um, whole food stores, a um, handful of restaurants, wholesalers, uh, really um, throughout the upper Midwest, um, uh, sort of fresh market certified organic vegetables. Um, I mentioned that we're renting the majority of our land. Um, we have a, this is a, this is our 20th season of certified organic production, Featherstone Farm, and uh, in, 19, uh, in 2007, we had a, a big event that that uh, flood event at our uh, former location, which forced us to relocate here to uh, our current location in Fillmore County, Minnesota. And um, that move uh, involved uh, uh, giving up land that we had long-term access, and and we've been renting farmland since then. So uh, this is one of our challenges here: is um, is uh, maintaining, in some cases, year-to-year leases. On farmland that that we rely on for uh, for uh, certified vegetable production. So um, we uh, uh, on these 132 acres uh, have about uh, 55 people working in season. A uh, number of us are uh, here year round. Probably 16 people in our shop and warehouse and office and distribution year round. Um, we do grow a lot of uh, storage crops. Um, November harvesting cabbage, carrots root crops and so forth, filling large storage coolers and then uh, retailing or uh, 
I should say, selling to retailers um, those cops all winter in the Twin Cities metro in particular. So we have a, a nine-month sales season, uh, even in the upper Midwest here, and um, fairly mechanized operation, uh, fairly diversified in terms of cover cropping and uh, other strategies that we have to utilize um, uh, crop acres that are not in vegetables in the rotation. Uh, a lot of focus on green energy and uh, and uh, uh, um, alternative energy here as well, uh, big picture sustainability. Uh, 20th year, we're still, we're still at it, I guess. Jack, you and I have known each other for a long time. I mean, uh, we started on, at my farm, uh, Rock Spring Farm in Northeast Iowa. We, we started selling into the Rochester Farmer's Market in uh, 2000. And I think that's when, when you and I would have met that year. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you guys actually started off working land that was owned by a housing cooperative in the Bluff Country in southeast Minnesota, right? Yes, that's right. Yep. My wife and I um, had had experiences working um, uh, different parts of the country on farms that had uh, communities of people on or nearby them. And um, uh, when we returned from uh, uh, California, Central Valley, California, to Southeast Minnesota in the mid '90s. It was important to us to be part of of, of creating and and uh, and operating our vegetable farm in a kind of a, a, a rural community of that sort. So, uh, my wife and I and three other couples were founding members of a land cooperative in Winona County. Uh, that's land that we bought in 1994, and uh, that's where Featherstone Fruits and Vegetables began. Uh, back in those very, very early years and uh, started going to the Rochester and Winona Farmers Markets. Very, very small CSA in 1997, our first certified organic year. And then, as you say, yeah, you and I must have met very shortly after that at that Rochester market. When you guys started off, were you thinking that you were going to someday be a 135-acre organic vegetable farm? No, I, I could never have imagined 135 acres, no. And uh, um, I, I don't think uh, I, any of us, my wife, my uh my brother, any of us that were involved in the early days could ever have envisioned it. But I had had the uh, uh, good fortune of working on uh, some fairly uh, substantial scale uh, vegetable farms, uh, New Morning Farm in Pennsylvania and Full Belly Farm in California. Both places we've had featured on the show. Jim Crawford was on, uh, I think, about a year ago, and then and then Drew Rivers was on this spring from, uh, from Full Belly Farm. Both very, very good friends of ours. And uh, Huge inspirations to uh, me and to my wife and to everything we do at Featherstone Farm. Uh, these places uh, were number one uh, doing um, vegetable farming as a sole source of income for a family livelihood, which was very, very important to me uh, as we thought about what we would be doing at Featherstone Farm, that we would not have to have off-farm jobs. And uh, and secondly, um, in the case of Full Belly Farm, um, had, uh, had, had uh, Spanish-speaking field help, which um, at, uh, at that time, early 90s, uh, I still had a little bit of high school Spanish left and, and made some connections with, uh, with Spanish speakers in the field at Full Belly in California. And that connection, that cultural, uh, that uh, uh, just that, that uh, international connection was a uh, really exciting, vibrant, uh, vital thing for me, um, even back in those very early days. So, uh, you know, I, I can't say that in 1997, when we certified our first crop at Featherstone Farm, I was... Of course, I could not have imagined 80 or 100 or 120 acres of vegetables, but the idea of having employees and, and having Spanish speakers and, uh, and uh, uh, reaching out a little bit beyond the local farmer's market and, and attempting to scale up a little bit to some degree, um, that I, can, I think I was certainly not adverse to that. And uh, uh, what I could not have really seen is, is how the market opportunities in the, uh, in the early and mid-2000s, you know, the exploding interest in uh, uh, local and organic foods. And, and in particular, I think the, the Twin Cities, uh, co-op scene and, and CSA scene up here, how, uh, uh, how much demand there would be and, um, uh, what kind of opportunities that would present to us and, uh, risks and rewards both, which we can get into, I guess. You know, the, uh, the idea of having too much opportunity, uh, in some ways, uh, as much a downside to us as, as, uh, as not having opportunities. So, um, we, we grew a lot in those early years, uh, not necessarily out of plan, but out of response to uh, uh, opportunities, uh, market demand, and um, and just uh, the, the ability, uh, you know, our ability to establish relationships with a, a family from Mexico that started to work in the very early 2000s, and then 
um, other employees and, and collaborators and partners that we've had through the years. Um, it's really been a, a collaborative effort all along. When you said some downfalls of having too much opportunity, too much of a marketing opportunity up in the Twin Cities, you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, you uh, at least I'll just say for myself anyway, um, uh, getting into organic farming in those very first few years, uh, you know, you, you just see the world as, as, as constantly a cup half full and, and, and a blue sky horizon and all these opportunities. And you, I, I think the human nature, or at least my nature, was to overestimate my ability and my farm's ability to meet those challenges and, and to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, I, it's not that I think we were too ambitious um, rather, I think um, we, and this is my wife and, and uh, uh, my, my uh, brother Ed that was part of things early on, and, and uh, eventually Reese Williams, uh, uh, a farm partner for a number of years there, we um, uh, responded to demand, people that food co-ops or, or CSA waiting lists or whatever, we, we, we tended to respond to demand for many, many years there by um, a kind of reflexive, sure, we can do that, um, we'll add another half acre, or we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put another uh, run in the wholesale route, or um, we'll, 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 we'll increase the CSA by 50 members or 100 members that year. We would respond to opportunities without really critical thinking about our ability to manage those sorts of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of new quantitative changes efficiently. And, um, you know, part of it, I think, is just, you know, uh, maybe a, a certain um, overconfidence or, or lack of critical thinking, whatever, but, uh, you know, the excess optimism, whatever. I think that, that taking advantage of all those opportunities had many positives and, and, and it put us in a good position now where we are uh, 15, 20 years later, but at the time, uh, cumulatively uh, produced a great deal of growing pain then. Um, as we overextended ourselves and, and, and maybe bit off more than we could chew. In 2007, you guys, like like everybody in southeast Minnesota, got nailed by this amazing rainstorm. I mean, I, I, 18, at my farm, and again, we were, you know, we were, I think, 45 minutes south of you guys, just mm-hmm. south of the Minnesota state line. And we got 18 inches of rain in 24 hours. I think you guys might have even gotten more up where you in were. In that range, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And and that was something that started a lot of, of changes for you guys. I mean, I feel like that really started a ball rolling where, you know, now you guys have obviously been dealing with, you said, growing pains. And I know that by 2007, I think uh, your wife, Jenny, wasn't, wasn't working on the farm anymore. I think your brother, Ed, was gone by that time. Am I right? Mm-hmm. That's right. Yep. Okay. Jenny had taken a, yep. uh, a, uh, a job in town and uh, we had three sons and, uh, and uh, Reese Williams had joined in uh, uh, as, a, as a full uh, farm partner and was running the place with me at that time. But we, we were still at that time in this um, it, based in this uh, uh, land cooperative that I mentioned earlier in Winona County. And um, what's important here, I think, and, and, and this, uh, looking back on things uh, retrospectively, if I had things to do differently, um, when, when Jenny and I returned from Full Belly in the uh, early 1990s and were beginning to look at where we might get established and where we might um, start Featherstone Farm, uh, we were, of course, we had, we had very, very, very little money. We had a lot of experience, a lot of excitement. We had this vision of community. But um, being, um, you know, relatively low on resources, um, you know, we tended to um, gravitate. I mean, our, our entire land co-op group gravitated towards uh, land that was affordable, right? I think we bought land, uh, that initial investment at uh, – the Zephyr Co-op was in the range of $400 an acre that we paid for that farm. And guess what? You get what you pay for. Um, we had um, chosen something that, um, that was a very beautiful piece of land, uh, but very, very marginal from an agricultural standpoint. And uh, I didn't recognize that. Uh, I, I looked at topsoil only. I didn't look at subsoil. I didn't look at air drainage. I didn't think about the proximity of all this woods. Um, with the deer pressure raccoons, which, which just uh, uh, tortured us for the better part of a decade, losses to uh, to wildlife, 
But most importantly, um, being in this very low flood plone, narrow valley where um, not just that flash flood 2007, but repeated floodings, uh, water in the fields, um, deer in the fields, uh, frost pockets, um, foliar disease because of lack of air circulation. Uh, we chose a C minus D plus vegetable site because it was affordable. And um, if I had to do all over again, and if I were getting into it right now, I would uh, certainly um, be much more uh, thoughtful about uh, choosing good ground, the very best ground for this type of agriculture that we practice here. Uh, better drained, um, less flood risk, um, less, prox less proximity to large stretches of woods where deer and, uh, and, and, uh, and raccoons and so forth. So. Yes, as you say, in 2007, we had five feet of water in many fields. Uh, we had uh, three feet of water in our packing shed. Um, it was obvious that organic certification in fields had been compromised um, really uh, uh, irretrievably in some cases. Um, and it just was the real uh, sort of the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of uh, um, you know going through this flooding thing again after, um, you know, um, more severely this time, but 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 it was a pattern, and um, we used that opportunity then to just more or less cash in our chips at uh, at, at uh, um, the uh, Zephyr Co-op and to relocate about eight miles away to what turned out and ultimately to be a real A plus vegetable site, and um, that has made all the difference in terms of turnaround, the type of uh, um, uh, change in, in the nature of our business, the success of our business. Our farm has just really taken off since that move in 2008, 2009, as gut wrenching as it was, out of this uh, this beautiful but unworkable um, narrow cold valley, Winona County, moving down here to uh, better ground um, and uh, uh, less flood prone, better drainage in uh, in our current location, Fillmore County, Minnesota. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting about your current location is that you guys are kind of right in the middle of an industrial park. That's right. We are in a, uh, in a very unique site here, um, close to the town of Rushford, Minnesota, a broad uh, floodplain that no longer floods, flat area that um, our local governance has zoned all industrial, not just commercial, industrial zoning. So many of our vegetable fields are surrounded by uh, chain link fences with razor wire and you know, gas plant and cement plant and a uh, full range of these things, huge campus of the, the uh, rural electrification co-op right here. Uh, we are landlocked by industry rather than by woods or geographic features. And so this is, um, this is, uh, uh, underlies this problem of, of land ownership, land access that I mentioned earlier. Uh, because of this industrial zoning, land prices here are uh, prohibitively expenses for agriculture, even for organic vegetables. And so we continue to rent uh, a lot of these fields, um, you know, that are certified or that are uh, zoned industrial, uh, more or less awaiting uh, landlords to sell to uh, development. And uh, that's a big existential problem for us, for sure. But one worth taking, one a, 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 a risk worth taking, a, a, a challenge worth trying to overcome because of the really unique and extraordinarily positive horticultural conditions, soil, geology, geography, um, whole range of things here, topography. Uh, we're in a truly an A-plus horticultural area, and so it's worth living with neighbors like this and the risks that I described. Yeah, I mean, you guys have, I mean, super deep topsoil, just, I mean, it's not, not laser level flat, but darn near laser level flat ground yep. that you're working on down there in that, down there in that floodplain and, and lots of agricultural land around you in that floodplain. But you guys are also farming quite a bit up on the ridges as well. Am I right? Yes, we have both locations for, for different reasons. And in this area of, of southeast Minnesota, what's called the bluff country, uh, there are <clears throat> not huge uh, uh, chain topograph topographical variations, but there's three, 400 feet of, of elevation gain that you can get over a, a two-mile drive up through the wood, up, up the wooded bluff here. And, and we are farming um, vegetables in both places, uh, high ridge and uh, valley um, four miles away. 
uh, somewhat as a risk abatement strategy. Um, some of it in term, uh, helps us to match certain vegetable crops with, um, you know, really ideal conditions. But uh, as you say, down here in the valley, we've got five feet of, of uh, black silt loam here with very, very high uh, organic matter and, um, and, and a huge, fertil- a huge uh, productive capacity. But the, the most important thing, I think, of all about, about our uh, uh, horticultural condition here and, and one that, uh, again, I did not think about when we set foot for the first time on the Zephyr Co-op 24 years ago, whatever, 22 years ago, subsoil, every bit as important as that topsoil. And uh, here in the valley, that five feet of silt loam sits on top of coarse grain sand that is at least 20, 30 feet thick and is just a giant sponge so uh, to dry out that topsoil. So we can get an inch of rain here and, and be out cultivating carrots or, or broccoli within, say, a day and a half, two days at the most. We never have standing water in fields. And uh, this is, you know, just golden for any vegetable producer that can, can imagine this kind of situation. We have the benefits of both sand and uh, high organic matter. And uh, so I think this would be certainly, again, if I had to look over to do all over again or, or um, uh, counseling younger farmers that I talk to, the idea of considering uh, uh, subsoil as well as topsoil when you're evaluating uh, where you're going to be as an overall complex of, of uh, soil drainage and, uh, and air drainage also, um, you know, the, 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 what it's going to take to get in and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, maintain, cultivate, and, uh, and harvest crops on your cycle, plant and, and, and harvest on your cycle, your succession planting, subsoil, air drainage, these things just every bit as important as, as, as the sand content or, the, or the, 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 the drainage in your topsoil. Having that farm located in, in the industrial park, or at least having your, your packing shed in your office and, and a good portion of the production down in that area, you don't live on the farm. No, um, sort of as a... As a, as a uh, 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 Aftermath of the, the uh, my wife and I leaving the land cooperative and, and flood loss and, and her taking a job in town, um, we actually have a house in, in Winona, which is about 20 miles away from this location. Uh, we are attempting to get another residence established here um, in a uh, on a piece of uh, real farmland on the ridge nearby our uh, commercial site, but uh, you know really it's a work in progress and and. Uh, you can only spend so much money on so many things, and 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 for the time being, <laughs> uh, maintaining a certain commute is is a price I I pay for uh, being able to invest more in uh, in in the the uh, uh, tool systems and people and uh, and and hopefully ultimately land that 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 make the that make our vegetable uh, farm uh, profitable enough then to eventually support uh, some the different housing arrangement for me. I think one of the other things that you've got going for you with this current piece of land that you're on is the the access that you have for logistics. You know, you've got your I I know from from being your neighbor that out there at Zephyr getting a truck out to the Zephyr Co-op was no small feat and involved a lot of gravel roads and a lot of twists and turns and really? particularly in the winter I think that was was a particularly trepidatious undertaking. Oh yeah, no. It was it, 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 our early again our er, that first site that we that we uh, that where we settled in the in the mid '90s there, uh, you know, really out in the in the in, in rural uh, areas in, in in a narrow valley, uh, many miles of narrow, uh, uh, minimally maintained crushed rock road, and uh, I would I think it was already in the early 2000s we began doing a certain amount of business with the Whole Foods distribution center in Chicago. And um, fairly early on, we were able to, to, to talk these folks uh, into sending uh, 53-foot reefer semis down to our place in, in that narrow valley, uh, doing backhauls from uh, deliveries in, in Minneapolis to Chicago. And, um, you know, how, how they were able to get in there, I mean, in retrospect, it was really tough. And um, n- now that when we did make that move out of that narrow valley and into um, the place we are now where there's much more pavement, much easier access, we have a larger loading dock area. Uh, we're about seven, eight miles from um, Interstate 90, which is obviously a big corridor connecting Rochester, Twin City, Chicago, Madison, and so forth. Um, being close to those, uh, being close to that interstate, and having um, easy access for trucks four seasons, 
it really does make what we do a lot easier, uh, particularly with the winter. As you mentioned, the winter shipping, pretty hard to imagine, uh, you know, trying to send a straight truck out of that narrow valley, you know, on a January morning when it's 15 below and there's uh, drifted snow on, on a minimally maintained road and so forth. Um, I, I, when we started in, in, in the early ni- mid-90s there and selected that place, again, I, I never in, really thought through what it would take to, to get crops to market and to get that, especially year-round, and to be able to keep this kind of, uh, of, of business model going. But, um, you know, we, we uh, ran smack up against those limitations in that previous location. When we got here to this uh, easier access place, yeah, absolutely, we realized, wow, how much harder that was and how much more predictable, how much more sustainable it is to be in a location that's, that's better suited for shipping uh, the volumes of stuff. We have uh, at this point now, really, I think it's uh, four full semi-trailers of crop rolling out of here um, on contract ship to the Twin Cities every week. And then we have straight trucks in the Twin Cities now that that, um, that do the uh, the dock to dock um, deliveries up there, receiving crop off of these 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 four uh, semi trailers a week, and 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 that's a that's a good model for us, and and makes it much easier for us to get our crop to our customers. So just to be clear about that, you're you guys aren't actually trucking your own produce up to the Twin Cities. Once the pro, you're you're hiring semi trucks to come in and move that product for you, and then once it's there. You guys are taking over the distribution at that point. Yes, uh, we have a really extraordinary uh, arrangement, and I think fortunate arrangement. And it, uh, it, 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 the thing that makes it possible and has made it possible for 20 years is our relationship with Club Partners Warehouse in St. Paul, mm-hmm. which serves as a sort of a hub for us. Um, where um, again, you know, we have these, we have, we have uh, four hired. Uh, trailers a week that would bring that bring loads to co-op partners, and then from from co-op partners um, uh, we we do a certain amount of hired deliveries on their trucks. Um, we have um, two straight trucks that off and on, and and a sprinter van. Um, the actually your old uh, Rock Spring Farm sprinter van still running up there. Did you ever take my logo and the and the carrots off of that van? <laughs> I don't think so. I think there's still people looking for uh, RockSpringFarm.com and 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 calling your five six three number. It's still on there. I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't know. I, I actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's doing you a disservice or not, but uh, we we just haven't taken the time. Still a good runner, that van, after all these years. But at any rate, uh, we're using those rigs then to, to take uh, full pallets and and, uh, and and full loads of, of crop off of the co-op partner's dock and then running them around uh, dock to dock, CSA drop to CSA drop with uh, drivers, to, uh, farm employees that are that live in the Twin Cities. So it's, it's kind of a... a, a, a uh, an arrangement. I mean, it, it allows us to um, to still keep our hands on a lot of on virtually all the CSA boxes, um, and, uh, and 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 gives us a great much greater reach in terms of how many sites we can serve in the Twin Cities without having to burn up huge numbers of miles and driver hours and uh, and straight truck uh, uh, wear and tear running up and down the interstate from here to the Twin Cities, which is about a hundred miles. So um, I think the efficiencies of, of bundling uh, crop and, and shipping them on these on these four trailers a week has, has really helped us to uh, um, not just increase the, the financial efficiency and uh, and the and the the, the, uh, the amount of our of our of our of our uh, expense structure based on that that we spend on distribution. It's not just financially efficient, but I think it's really smart on the fuel and the carbon and the um, just the overall wear and tear on equipment and people. It's just much more sustainable. Well, I think one of the real challenges that a lot of times, even if you're delivering four days a week that, that people have is that you're only using your trucks four days a week, you know, where, you know, you look at a, you know, you look at a model, um, I mean, UPS, it's five days a week. Um, Postal service now, at least in our area, is actually doing deliveries with their vehicles seven days a week. We get we get delivery on Sunday of some stuff here. Um, when you can spread out those capital costs over more days, um, and it's not just capital costs, of course, it's drivers and and everything else. Um, Absolutely, you Absolutely. really get a level of efficiency that you just don't get if you're only going to market 
you know, once or twice a week and trying to have to and having to maintain a, a vehicle just for that purpose. Yeah, these are the types of lessons that it just, you know, that you don't, uh, I certainly did not understand at all getting into this 20 years ago and just little by little by little, the the reality of the economics of it, you know, to, to buy a straight truck for 40 or 50 or, or 80,000 bucks, even used market and to have it, like you say, running three, four days a week for even six, seven months of the year. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of, of uh, depreciation of the thing just sitting on the, in, in a lot someplace and not making money for your, your farm business. And, um, you know, it's, it's just it, you have to really be careful about where you invest and things like that. And you have to be pretty ca- cautious about, about uh, uh, where tying up capital in those, those kinds of ways. And so, um, yeah, I'm not sure we've got the best system, but we have something that does seem to be working better for us now. And, um, you know, I, I think... I, I, I would like to say that it would be replicable for virtually any farm, but the reality of it is that, that so much of it is, is, in our case, is based around a relationship with a, a single warehouse in the Twin Cities that, that supports this, encourages, and, and enables us in a hundred different ways. Um, boy, if there were co-op partners and, and uh, co-op partners warehouse in, in every major city in the United States, it would be so much easier for farms like ours to to increase the um, – scope of their distribution and the, uh, the range, you know, the, the types of docks, the types of customers that they could get to, uh, rather than, uh, you know, uh, driving 100 miles before you even make your first delivery. Well, I remember what a change it made in my quality of life, as well as in just the workflow on our farm, when when you guys started being a part of cross docking. So for, for a number of years, we would bring product. Well, first we started by driving it up to you and then you ended up leasing our truck and coming down and picking up our product at the farm and eventually Mm -hmm. bought our sprinter, but working with you to actually manage those logistics so that we weren't investing that 10 to 12 hours a week of actually being off the farm, driving around, um, you know, being able to stay at home and stay focused on the things that were really important and getting that delivery monkey off of our back was, was a big deal. Oh, big time. Yeah. You know, delivery of crop from your cooler your farm base wherever to your end customer whether it's csa member or a store or a warehouse in a distant place it is a necessary function for any farm um you know from at that time you were probably doing 15 16 acres up to us 130 acres it has to happen but yet it is um really a drain on what i think is ultimately core function of that we are ultimately vegetable producers and if you or I or any farm owner manager is spending more than a small percentage of their time worrying about truck breakdowns or um, getting to a dock before it closes at one o'clock or a CSA member that's 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 calling because their uh, box is delayed because the truck broke down on the side of the highway, those are things that undercut the the fundamental. Um, core mission of the of the farm business, which is to grow those crops to begin with. And I don't want to diminish the importance of the distribution. It's extremely important. But uh, it really comes down to what you as a farmer value and what is important to you, where you find your, your, your it, 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 where your best use of your time is. And I think you discovered and I certainly discovered that, that driving crops and worrying about drivers and worrying about um, running equipment, uh, road, uh, trucks, I should say, breakdowns and, and refrigeration equipment, this and that, that those things are ultimately big distractions from what we set out to do, which is ultimately grow vegetables. Well, and I guess if you look out in the business world, right, UPS doesn't sell things and Amazon doesn't ship things. Right. You know, exactly. they 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 focus on the things that they're best at. At the core of their business is is really what matters to them. They figure out other ways to get that other stuff done. So you've got trucks up in the Twin Cities. You said a hundred miles away. I mean, that's a two hour drive from where from where you're located. You've got staff that are working up there doing very physical tasks, not the kinds of things that you would normally think of somebody doing uh, working from home or working at a distance on. It's not like office work or, or computer programming. How are you managing those people and what do you do when things go wrong up in the cities? How do you deal with that? 
Right. Yeah, these are just critical questions, and uh, you're absolutely right. We've got truck drivers. Um, certain times of year, we have people that are actually stacking pallets and and, and organizing orders um, for deliveries in in uh, in places in the cities. We have a marketing person, a salesperson in the Twin Cities. Yes, uh, keeping track of these people, um, keeping the systems tied together from uh, um, all through all aspects of the of the. Uh, the operation is, is very, very time-consuming and very specialized in really challenging work. And uh, I was reminded, when you just mentioned moments ago, Chris, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the relief that, that, that you at Rock Spring Farm felt at um, getting um, you know, over a course of a year or two there, a lot of these delivery issues off your backs and, and uh, outsourced to us at the time where we would eventually even come right to your dock, pick up your, your, all, your handful of pallets, CSA boxes, wholesale deliveries, bring them to our place, feed them into a supply chain, break down into a, a, a drop site by a commercial customer, by restaurant, whatever, and then, and then the paper trail and then do those deliveries. When you said moments ago how, what a relief that was to you um, as a farmer at that time, the other side of that coin was that here at Featherstone Farm, um, taking on that role for you as well at, for Rock Spring Farm, as well as upgrading our own capacity, turned out to be um, a, um, a logistical um, organization and management um, just a, an implementation and an accountability challenge that I could never, ever have anticipated. And um, I think this just sort of goes hand in hand with the whole complex of growing pains that I referred to earlier, going from five acres in 1997 when when we just uh, when we really didn't understand our capacity to manage things, you know, our you know individual skills, things that we were good at, things that we were not good at. Um, up through our current position where we have multiple coordinators, uh, mid-level managers that are, are, are really taking responsibility for things like distribution in the Twin Cities that are managing those drivers that we talked about a moment ago, that are uh, uh, following the supply chain and the paperwork, the audit trail through all of this. The process for me to learn about what it takes to keep that type of operation going, so much of it, as you say, 100 miles away, um, and, and learning largely by trial and error and by making mistakes and by creating huge hardship for myself and for employees because, uh, uh, as I said before, often we would overestimate our capacity to manage these things um, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and not resource things sufficiently. That's one of these great challenges that I think we're still working on here, but I think little by little getting our arms around at Featherstone Farm. It is not easy. You've got to find the right people that are willing to um, take responsibility for things, that are willing to be accountable, to set up paperwork and, um, and organizational systems to tie all these things together. And just a, a, just a, a straight acknowledgement, Chris, of the person that helped us more than any other getting that together, and that is you. And, um, you know, I'm exceptionally grateful to you for what you've done. Help us uh, pull this off because um, I did not know what I was doing uh, six, eight years ago. And I think uh, without, without your help, I, I would not be a, <clears throat> have survived these things or be able to talk about them even as a work in progress. We would have long since given this up. Well, yeah, just to put some context on on that for for the audience here. So, you know, I do consulting work this is a large part of, of, of what I'm doing now that I'm not farming. But I also was doing some of that during the time I was farming. And and Jack, you came to me in 2011 and said, you know, can can you come up and take a look at our operation and help us figure out how to how to implement some of these systems? And I think, like you said, the the stuff around the trucking really highlighted something that had taken you a long time to get into. Um, we worked together 2011, I think all the way until 2013, almost on a weekly basis, um, yes. for much of the year, um, just hammering away at, at, at these, at these, uh, at the challenges that you were facing and, and how to deal with that. And, and I think it, it wasn't something that, that it wasn't a problem that developed overnight. And I mean, you said in our pre-show chat here, it's something that you got, you know, you're only just now really feeling like you're getting those monkeys off of your back. Yep. Nope. Absolutely. I'm just starting to get my arms around it. And, uh, 
the, 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 it, it's really fundamentally a problem of, or it was in my case anyway, uh, of, of my understanding of what I was attempting to do, what I was attempting to outsource to others, what I was, uh, the, the, the nature of the challenge and the limits on my ability to manage those things. And, um, you know, it, these problems, like I, like I, I mentioned before, they, they do, they creep up very slowly. Um, when we moved to uh, Rushford in the aftermath of flooding in 2007, it was a kind of a two-year process. By 2009, we had this building up and we're fully located here in Rushford. At that time, we were doing about six hundred or $650,000 worth of annual sales a year. Now we're uh, very up, we're up near $2 million of sales a year. And so we have tripled the size of this business in the last seven years. And what that, you don't just go from, from, from one scale to the next in the blink of an eye. What we had here was a series of uh, quantitative changes. A couple more acres here, another co-op there, a couple more employees on the other side, another tractor, a couple more cultivators, a couple more acres of brassicas. Uh, Whole Foods opens another couple of stores, so we have another couple of accounts, another route, another truck. Uh, quantitative changes, two more employees, five more employees, another person in the office, uh, another three more pickups, another tractor, two more cultivators, and so forth. Quantitative changes <coughs> which slowly over time approach a tipping point at which you suddenly have a qualitatively different type of farm on your hands. And I did not see this. I did not understand it. And uh, what I mean by qualitatively different, uh, and I think what you helped me to see um, in those critical years, 2011, 2013, was that we went from a farm in which I, as the owner-operator, was at least marginally capable of uh, hiring every individual, making most of the field decisions, um, solving most of the problems around a, a given truck or a route, uh, maintaining most of the relationships with customers, if not CSA, with some of the, the, the buyers at the food co-ops, for example. We went from a, a business where I could largely handle most of those things reasonably well myself to a place where it was just vastly more complicated and, and uh, more difficult, excuse me, more challenging than I could have anticipated. And then you make that flip, uh, you know, the tipping point is reached. You must have middle managers to help take responsibility and accountability for um, managing different aspects, whether it's distribution or office functions or relationships with uh, customers, a CSA program, and so forth. Uh, now, at this time, we have a horticulture team of uh, three, four people, uh, given depending on different time of year, who are responsible for the crops themselves. I do a lot of tractor driving. I'm more out in the field now than I have been in years, but I don't make a lot of the critical decisions about managing individual crops because I simply can't do that. I don't have the time or focus. And so I have to turn that over to a horticulture team of people who are specifically uh, hired and responsible for maintaining crop groups in the field day by day. But the, the, uh, the, the difficulty for me was understanding how many of those people we needed, how to resource those people, how to hold them accountable, how to keep them on task, and then ultimately how to keep the field production people coordinated with the harvest people, coordinated with the warehouse and receiving people, coordinated with the distribution people, and the office and the repair shop as the, uh, the sort of the uh, connected tissue between all those parts. And um, this is a business organization and management challenge rather than a farmer challenge. Certainly th something that I was not prepared for um, and when we made the move down here. I did not see it coming. And uh, so a lot of the stress and growing pains and employee burnout that occurred when you were here uh, that precipitated me asking you to come in here based on this idea that we had probably reached that tipping point, but I didn't know it. And it took, uh, it took it, at some level, an outsider like yourself who was familiar with the general nature of the business and good head on his shoulders to just help me understand what had happened and what I needed to do about it. So, um, you know, again, in retrospect, I, I uh, uh, you know, maybe things could have happened differently and I could have uh, 
uh, grown more slowly, uh, been more deliberate about some of the decisions, these quantitative decisions, you know, do I, you know, be more realistic about my ability to add things and manage them well? But uh, it, things that developed the way they did, and, and um, you know, fortunately, I'm still in the business. I, I managed to, to, to keep things going with the help of a lot of really good people here, for sure. Well, and I think that's an important point to make. I mean, you're giving me a lot of credit, but you've had some other really excellent advisors, and you've you've managed to get some good staff around you. Um, so, I mean, outside advisors and inside advisors who've been able to help you with this process as well. It wasn't just it wasn't just you know. I didn't come in and work any miracles. I guess that's what no, that's what I'd say. No, 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 but it, not by any means. And and that's the, I think this is really you you hit on really what I think is the really the most uh, wonderful and the the, the just the the the, uh, the most exciting thing about what what Featherstone Farm has become to me is is it really is a vital community of people up and down the line from our CSA members that step up on on uh, working on, on on some of these various campaigns we've had um, and. Uh, 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 our neighbors and, and collaborators in the area, other farmers, conventional as well as organic farmers that we work with in our area, uh, certainly employees inside and out, up and down the line, um, English speakers and Spanish speakers and, and Hmong speakers and, and um, everyone in between. It has just really been a collaborative process, and I have um, hopefully learned what I can from, from a lot of these folks but I think what what I needed most, and what I think you provided uniquely, was um, the, uh, the 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 kick in the pants to change my own thinking about um, my relationship with people and my ability, my need to properly resource and support some of these employees and these managers, so that they were able to do their jobs and, and be successful, um, rather than um, be constantly butting up against limits that, that that I had inadvertently put in place because I didn't understand what I was asking them to do. I think one of the things that really mattered in this, Jack, was that you you put the time in, right? I mean, I, I remember how difficult it was sometimes to, I think it was on Thursdays or Wednesdays, we would we would have breakfast every Wednesday, you know, and you had to, you you had a meeting with your top level managers and me for for an hour or two hours every Wednesday morning. And like just making that time, I think was a was a, a manifestation of your commitment. To solving the problems that had that had come up in your farm operation, I think that you really put in the effort, and I think that was I think that was one of the big lessons for you in this was was that it it wasn't enough to just say you wanted things to be different or to wish things that were di- would be different, but you actually had to do things differently, and that meant that you actually had to put time and energy into doing them differently. Yes, no, uh, you're absolutely right about it. You know, I, I think you starting Rock Spring Farm, me starting Featherstone Farm, I think many of your listeners here who are growing vegetables, who are doing this, uh, yes, it's a farm business, but yes, it, but it is also a, a, a thing of just a, 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 a vocation for a lot of us. And many of us have gotten into it because of, of, of just this, this uh, fascination with it and delight with, this, with, with the idea of growing things. And working outdoors and being engaged with the crops and feeding people and uh, and all of these uh, intangible things, these quality of life things, the things that make our work important. Um, but what had happened to me was that the you know, that that as I invested in that over time and, and was relatively successful in that over the years, um, you know that, that we were I don't want to say quite this way, but in some level victims of our own success in this unmanaged growth to a place where, again, we passed certain tipping point where, where I could no longer do those things that I loved to do as much. I was not out on the tractor. I was not walking crops. I was not cultivating. I was not thinking about uh, crop rotations. I wasn't doing any. I was neglecting these things because, uh, these, uh, because these chronic issues that w- w- were occurring with, uh, with uh, uh, organizing our warehouse deliveries or issues with distribution or accountability in the office or, or this, that, or the other were, were, were constantly pulling me out of the field. And so at some level, I had no choice but to put the time in that you describe to uh, envision and develop a different way of doing things. And the good news is that that over time, and it has taken years to pull this off, it is a step-by-step, slow grind to uh, uh, piece-by-piece, step-by-step, resolve some of these things. 
the good news is it has resulted in me getting back out and uh, and getting a good sunburn on the back of my neck this year and, and, and spending a lot more time out walking crops and driving tractor and transplanting and cultivating and the things that, that got me into this to begin with. And uh, so there is light at the end of the tunnel for some of your listeners that are undoubtedly struggling with some of these same growing pains, uh, particularly around employees and around complexities with uh, with distribution and, and um Oh, just all of the the, the, the business uh, dynamics and and uh, just it's 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 difficult. I don't I don't mean to say that it's it's a cakewalk at all. It takes work, but there is a payoff if uh, if you pay attention to what's important to you and over time what 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 you're best at doing and what's best to to hire someone else or, or or find someone else to take responsibility for if you're not capable of doing it. So, Jack, I think with that, I'd like to stop and take a break, get a word from our sponsors. And when we come back, I, I want to really dig into what you're doing actually to hold people accountable and to keep people on task and some of the systems that you put in place to actually physically do that management work of of keeping your mid-level managers doing their work. Sure. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. In the transplant greenhouse, all of your investment in plant material, heat, labor, and overhead depends absolutely on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And that media has a really hard job to do. Produce a healthy plant in just a few cubic centimeters of soil. When I started farming, I focused on getting the cheapest ingredients that I could to make my own potting soil and later on finding cheap potting soil already put together. But I found that what so many farmers have, that saving money on inputs doesn't always result in increased profits. Jennifer at Vermont Compost can tell story after story of customers who switch to less expensive options, but who have come back to Vermont Compost for the consistency and the quality of their potting soils. And even though it's not all about saving money, Vermont Compost pre-buy program can help you get what your plants need at the best price with the best shipping options delivered at a time that works best for you. Plus, their shared truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that gets shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. Feed the soil. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. A BCS two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need. With PTO-driven attachments like the rototiller, flail mower, power harrow, rotary plow, snow thrower, log splitter, and more. You name it, and you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller way back in 1991, it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor, and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheeled farm tractors. I've used other tillers and mowers and spent most of the time thinking about how much easier it would be with a BCS. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. And even though we owned a four-wheeled tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, the BCS tackled important jobs that we couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments. And we're back with Jack Hedin from Featherstone Fruits and Vegetables in Rushford, Minnesota. So, Jack, while we were on break, we were talking a little bit, and, and you said you made a comment about core versus supportive functions and really understanding how those things work together. Could you could you say again what you said while we were on break? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I mentioned before break uh, when we were talking that, um, you know, I got into this to grow vegetables and because of the passion of the agriculture. And that still remains, uh, you know, my core uh, interest here and the thing that, that ultimately drives Featherstone Farm. We are a vegetable producer. And, and uh, that is, um, you know, is and has always been number one here. We are a vegetable farm. Uh, but the, the, in the process of, of this growth and development that we've been discussing, um, you know, I, I guess I, I realized that for many years, um, I deemed anything that was not central to that, that core mission of growing the crop, those secondary functions like uh, the office component, the, uh, the marketing and the sales and marketing, the distribution, the, the repair and maintenance shop, the thing of just keeping the infrastructure and the uh, the uh, maintained and the gears oiled and so forth. Those all those supportive functions, I, I really undervalued and frankly under resourced as a farm owner and farm manager. 
and um, I, I did not, uh, uh, in my own head, I think it's really, it was in my, it was a lack of understanding in my, in my part about um, the, uh, uh, the, the value of these things and, and the importance of having enough people, enough resources, enough time invested in them. And so, uh, you know, through the course of, of, of these, uh, these growing pains and sort of reevaluating things here, I've come to understand that, 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 that our office here at Featherstone Farm, for example, a year and a half ago, two years ago, we had basically one and a half people up here um, in the office doing everything from uh, bookkeeping and, and finances to uh, sales, um, a lot of the, 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 the compliance stuff on, uh, on food safety and, and uh, insurance and uh, administrative tasks of all sorts, um, up and down the line there. Uh, uh, managing and, and administering daily sales orders and, and uh, so forth. Now we have a year and a half, two years later, we have uh, four people uh, that are um, not full time, but three full time and, and actually two part time people that are in 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 in, in aggregate uh, uh, carrying out these these hugely important supportive functions for our vegetable farm and having the, enough people. That uh, have enough time and enough resources to uh, to do these things ultimately is saving me a lot more uh, not just time but blood sweat and tears as a farmer um, in that in that um, um, we get uh, uh, news about an insurance audit or a, a, a food safety visit or a, 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 some sort of a a tax question comes up, an audit of some sort, IRS or whatever, and I feel as though we are completely prepared, and that uh, uh, and that I have really little to worry about because we've taken advantage, we've taken care of those things, the, the accountability um, uh, in advance, and we've been crossing T's and dotting I's in our in our business office, and that is a, just an indescribably important thing for me as a small business owner, as a farmer, that allows me to. Um, uh, know that if I'm out scouting um, crops with a field manager or a, or a horticulture team person, that there could be a major problem with a distribution uh, route or a truck breakdown or a, um, an employee issue and or a, a visa problem with a with a, a, a person coming to the field crew, whatever. And that there are people that are on top of those issues um, and, and 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 that are going to resolve those things without me having to get involved. And uh, again, those th those sorts of things, uh, recruiting people through um, H-2A visas and, and, and all of the, the account and uh, bureaucracy of H-2A process, um, uh, insurance, reading the fine print and in insurance policy and making sure that, that we're covered or that we're not overpaying for this or that, uh, following through on, 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 uh, on HR functions and doing employee reviews. These are supporting the core function of vegetable farming around here, but they are indescribably important. And if they're not taken care of properly, then the, the vegetable production part gets you know, suffers and the vegetable farmer, my, me, myself in particular and others around here, get drawn into things that really distract us from what we're here to do most importantly, which is ultimately growing vegetables. To use probably an overused analogy, I think it's like the foundation of a house, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's not most for most people, the basement isn't what the house is about. If that piece of the house isn't working right, you yep. know everything else kind of goes to hell in a handbasket. Oh, the, the plumbing trains and the uh, the heater and uh, uh, all of those things. The 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 the, the cinder block that holds the thing up keeps the roof on straight. If those things are not functioning right, absolutely, then then you just you just cannot have it, it, things 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 uh, suffer and fail. And and, uh, and 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 the and the whole the whole the whole structure is, um, is is threatened, no doubt about it. And I just simply undervalued those things. Again, I was idealistic. I was interested in the farming. At some level, I felt as though growing a good crop and being fair with uh, customers and being fair-minded, a, a, a responsible employer. That if I just did those three things: good, solid, organic practice. Um, good, solid, um, transparent relationships with customers, and, um, and and fair, responsible employment. If I took, if I had those three bases covered, then everything else would take care of itself. And that was incredibly naive and and uh, short-sighted. And um, and and uh, um, I just realized that 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 I, I did myself. I did every uh, employee of Featherstone Farm, my family, a disservice. 
by um, undervaluing those support functions for all these years. And Jack, it seems to me like whether you're talking about the people who are in your support functions, the the bookkeeping and the sales and the marketing and the distribution, or whether you're talking about people that are working in your core functions, doing the actual farm work or your or your horticulture team, your harvest team, it seems like there's there's two important parts of that. One is finding the right people, finding good people. And then the other is is actually how you do that what I think of as that that employee management work. That mm-hmm. how do you how do you actually give people directions, hold them accountable, keep them on task. Can you, and I'd like to talk about both those things, but can can you tell us a little bit about your systems for actually doing that management work? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a, first of all, I'll say it's a very much a work in progress. I think we've got something that's working pretty well right now, but uh, uh, um, it is uh, it is still evolving. I, I can't say that I'm I'm ready uh, to, to go around uh, doing any any management level seminars for for small farm employment. But uh, what we've done here over time, I think, is is to create. Uh, and, and I think you, I think you are the first person to really call this out and name it this way, and 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 as, and to describe it in a way that, that 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 helps me frame it now to this day is creating systems to run things, and to rely on those systems and those written, very clear, very transparent um, standard operating procedures or or, uh, or policies for the farm or. Uh, even goals, even beginning with a mission statement for the farm about what we're trying to accomplish, what we value, what is important to us here. This it, it begins with being very, very, very clear um, about um, uh, uh, about the you know again mission statement right on through through all aspects of your employee handbook and uh, and everything. What you expect of the people working here and what their roles are, job descriptions. I think you and I spent uh, weeks and weeks and weeks tweaking um, uh, our organization chart to frame a way of thinking about the various roles, uh, key uh, core roles like production, uh, uh, supportive roles in, in the warehouse or repair shop, and, uh, and how to organize those things and how to describe the different jobs uh, that exist within that system. So it's really first and foremost about describing and being very clear and having written uh, where anyone can see it inside and outside the organization. What is what is the organization? How is it structured? Who's expected to do what? Who is responsible for this? Who's accountable for that? Who has these rights? Who has those responsibilities? Job descriptions and so forth. So that is the very uh, you know when you get into any kind of a again a, 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 a an organization. Is large enough to require decision making and important decision making and responsibility at various levels of the organization, not just me sitting in an office or talking with someone on a cell phone and, and making every call, but empowering and uh, and and uh, relying on people to make important decisions up and down the organization. You have to have that structure in place. You have to have that system defined clearly, and then it's ultimately. Uh, you know, as you say, having people perform within those roles uh, gets into a much more subjective um, and much more, um, uh, in some level, challenging um, uh, level of this. But you, you begin with the assumption that most everyone that works here, uh, in, in, you know, 99 people out of 100 that walk through this door are really committed to being uh, good employees and, and really um, uh, uh, wanting to do the right thing, but just understanding what is expected of them and where the the, the expectations are. Um, that, you know, uh, if, if we begin with that with that, that, that expectation and that we provide job descriptions and we have real clear um, uh, uh, communications with people about what, uh, if they have questions, who they turn to, uh, what the performance standards are and so forth, then we, you try to get it out of the role of subjective managing people uh, and more as much as possible into the question of objectively implementing a system with clearly described um, uh, 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 expectations. And it sounds, you know, very uh, clinical and cold and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, kind of like a machine, and I understand that, but... Um, I have really come to understand that that um, that having that expectation in place for people 
and, and being clear and, and having that structure, that system there, uh, that objective uh, framework for the way in which everyone from uh, the, the newest field picker right up to the highest level field manager or office manager around here, it really allows people to function as human beings and to have more of a, uh, of a personal relationship with people. Um, you know, you, you, you take a lot of those, um, a lot of the, 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 the unhealthy um, interpersonal dynamics out of the equation. You say, this is what I expect of you. And, um, and this, here's what you have, the resources to, to get it done. And if you can't get it done, uh, then, you know, by all means, come to me and, 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 and we'll figure out how to, how to either change the expectation or get more resources to help you or whatever it may be. But it, 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 to me, it, it allows for much healthier relationships with employees, uh, employer, employee, uh, manager, managee, up and down the line. Uh, the, the better the system is defined, I think, the more um, people feel free to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to excel and, and to do their best and, you know, to follow their best aspirations as employees within that system. So you, you talked about some of the elements of the system, the, the, the job descriptions, the, the organization chart. Um, what are some other elements of your management system? I think you mentioned earlier doing employee reviews. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I can no longer do all those reviews. So we have people that, you know, we have uh, uh, coordinators that are, they're doing a lot of that hiring and firing and, uh, well, not, fortunately, not so much firing. We don't have have to do very often at all, but uh, hiring, training, accountability work, those performance reviews, um, you know, communications, uh, accountability, I think is really important so that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. And and if, if someone in the warehouse uh, finishes stacking pallets 10, 11 o'clock at night and doesn't send that critical email to the drivers in Minneapolis or to a, a, a store that says that they're shorted this many boxes or that, uh, oh, whatever, that the, that the driver has to look in a different cooler for something. If, if there's not that, that, that kind of uh, connecting the dots and, and following through on systems that are outlined uh, um, uh, in advance of season, you know, that, 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 that people get, uh, very respectfully, um, uh, asked to, you know, to, uh, help to account on that. You know, you, you, you need to do this better. And, and the implications of you not doing this are, are that, that other people down the, down the line are, are, are having to suffer, work harder, make, make, uh, make, uh, uh, you know, have to compensate for those things. And so, again, the, the idea of creating, I mean, I think the other idea of this system is it creates this idea of, of, us, of us being all in this part of this same teamwork effort here. It's a, it's a cooperative enterprise at some level. And, um, you know, just making sure that people understand if, if they don't send that email, if they don't um, really communicate exactly, um, you know, what they want in a, in a particular cultivation job in the field or exactly how they want uh, uh, a cell filled in the greenhouse, you know, the, and how they want a, a crop seeded uh, in the greenhouse or, or exactly the, the bunch size of a, a, in a kale harvest or any of these countless details that we do. Um, day by day, uh, these implementation things on, on a vegetable farm and so diverse and so many different decision points. If, if, if we're not clear on communicating just what we expect, then, then how can we possibly, um, you know, hold people accountable? But, um, you know, it'd be the, the best way to make sure that people do perform that way is, again, to give that context and that create that sense of uh, teamwork and, and, and where your role fits in with everyone else and, 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 you know, you succeeding in your role and doing your job makes everything easier for everyone else and, and makes the thing work more efficiently, more sustainably. So break that down for me at a real nuts and bolts level. And let's, let's pull out something like crop cultivation. Okay. Some, mm-hmm. you know, going out and killing weeds. Cause I think this is actually, you know, one of the, the most tremendously subjective undertakings that you can have. And, and you're, you've got people. So you're standing there as the, as the farm owner mm-hmm. and, and you've got an expectation that, that you're going to get a good crop of carrots and not put too many weed seeds back in the ground. But then underneath you, you've got somebody else who has to tell somebody else to go out and cultivate those carrots and give them the parameters for success. How do, at, at a real nuts and bolts level, how, do, how are you breaking down what success looks like and, and what, what's the format for how you're doing that or how your mid-level managers are doing that. Yep. Well, we have frankly gone, and this, this is one of these work culture things that I think perhaps more than, than, than any other, I could never have envisioned even six, eight years ago. We have gone to a very um, 
uh, detailed, uh, paper-based system for writing things down and work orders and work logs that, frankly, I think you, as much as anyone else, helped us put into place and that we followed through on to this day, four, five, six years later. Um, you know, I used to be, and I, just for, for context on this, Chris, well, you well know when you came out here in 2011, I, I was a very intuitive, uh, seat-of-the-pants kind of a, of, of a farmer. I'd walk out in the field and, and, and just uh, on the basis of... Uh, of, 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 a, of a quick assessment, you know, I'd say this needs cultivated in, in this way, and maybe this kind of kind of a shovel idea, and, and talk, thinking out loud, and, and uh, maybe the person I was walking with would or would not understand just what I meant, or would understand who was supposed to follow through on it, or or, or how they were supposed to get the tractor freed up in order to go do it. Uh, that kind of thing just doesn't work at at, at some level in, in order to create something that really functions efficiently. You need a written system. And so in the case of carrots, the one that you, you, you refer to there, we have a crop manager, a member of the horticulture team, whose only job on the farm is managing direct seeded crops uh, from things like spinach and, uh, and peas in the spring through uh, sweet corn and carrots in the uh, sweet corn in the summer, uh, carrots and root crops in the fall. Now we're planting now early July. That person's job is just to make sure that those crops are uh, established, uh, cared for, and right up through the point of harvest maintained in the field up to, um, uh, up to a certain plan that we've all put on the table and developed together as a horticulture team in the winter. So the crop manager would, would, would go out and assess the carrots and, uh, and decide, okay, we need to use... Um, uh, uh, we need to write up a work order for a very particular cultivator, budding baskets or uh, particular shovels or our alloway cultivators, and, and they need to be set up in, in this format, and we want this level of tolerance on the row, and we need to get in that close, and we want to avoid doing this, and we want to do that to define success clearly on a written work order that gets submitted to the the, uh, the field production coordinator on a weekly basis, whole series sets of these these work orders that come from the various crop managers to the field production coordinator that whose job is to take and collate all of them and to allocate resources between tractors and cultivators and operators and so forth, translate those work orders into um, you know jobs for people um, that, that on a day-to-day basis go out and take the Kubota and cultivate uh, those carrots on that day with these uh, these definitions of success, this kind of t- tolerance, uh, whatever. And then when you're done with that, um, you know, fill out a, a, a log to suggest how long it took you and, and uh, what did, what did not work. So we can learn from that in the winter when we collate all the things. And then um, and then the crop manager goes back out there and, and really sees whether it was done uh, to those specs that were outlined in the original work order. And if there's a problem then uh, uh, we, we have a, a chance to, to feed back into the loop and, and, and take corrective action and so forth, all through this written system about uh, uh, that, that sets up those expectations and, and follows through to see that they were accomplished. So again, it's, it's very, very, very different than the way I did things for the first 10, 12 years out here at Featherstone Farm. But at the level of scale and complexity and, and frankly, the, the level of, of, of quality, um, you know, the high level the work performance that we now require to grow all these crops, uh, I feel like it's really necessary. And it required me learning how to, how to, how to do this myself to some degree, but to find and empower people, the, the, the crop managers and the field production coordinator who, um, who, who have this in their DNA and who understand what's required and uh, who go out and get it done. And what about finding the right people? Because in a system that you've just described, you know, it's not always easy to, to attract people who are going to plug themselves into that kind of a system, who are going to fill out the paperwork, who are going to be responsive to, to correction. How have you gone about attracting the right people, especially, I mean, Rushford's not a big town. And you guys aren't really located close to any big towns. No, it's it's been uh, it's been uh, hit and miss, and and a lot of luck involved. Uh, uh, people have seemed to present themselves the right people at the right times. Sure, there are gaps, and and uh, absolutely, we at some level we're always hiring uh, for the right people. We we try to create. Um, uh, opportunities for people and develop people. Uh, we have a number of folks, crop managers here, who started 
your um, driving tractor or picking beans or, uh, you know, uh, as, as newbies that without any experience before they came here, some people with very limited experience on other vegetable farms that over time have two, three, four years have, 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 have taken on more and more and more responsibility and are now functioning at this very high level. Um, you know, it's really, I think, number one, about creating this work culture and this expectation that, that we are going to write things down and we are going to to be accountable in this way and, and rather than just uh, 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 me uh, thinking out loud and, and recommending things and, and hoping and, and praying that they do, uh, they, they, they catch as I hope they would. Uh, so, you know, we, it, it's changing that work culture and, and, and creating that environment where people feel excited about getting things done. And But, you know, the one thing is for sure, too, that success breeds more buy-in. And I think people have seen, I myself, probably more than anyone else, have seen how Going from a chaotic, uh, intuitive system, you know, I don't even want to use the word system, a form of doing things, way of doing things like we did four or five years ago, the results that produced compared with the, um, the results that we get now with this more orderly, um, uh, uh, more professional type of system, I mean, the results speak for themselves. And, and more than anything, I think people want to work in, in, in environments and in organizations that are working, that are producing results, that, 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 that grow a really healthy crop of weed-free, disease-free carrots that we can all be proud of into the year and, uh, and that pay the bills and, and that, 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 uh, that will allow us to, uh, to, to pay people accordingly. It's, you know, people like to be associated with successful um, uh, enterprises, not to see their, their, their efforts establishing a nice crop of squash, winter squash, uh, consumed by weeds because we didn't have really good effective strategies or, 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 or systems for controlling those weeds. Even if we had the tools sitting in the shop, if they weren't getting used right, um, you might as well not have had that tractor or that cultivator set up if it wasn't um, brought to bear at the right time uh, in the right setup uh, and, uh, and, 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 then, and then followed up with the, the following week with the, with, the, with the next round of cultivation in a different way. So, so I think success breeds success, and, and people want to see things work out. And you know, even people like myself that that, that might have uh, you know done things a certain way for a lot of years in other farms or in other operations, when they get around this kind of a system, if they see it working, and they understand what's expected of them, and and uh, and they see that their work is, is you know pays off and, and gets good results, I think people buy in and and want to stick around. And that that in turn then feeds back with employee retention and we keep people around for two, three, and five years and, and that makes it that much easier than the following season. So, it, you know, it really, it's, it's been something that as we started to turn the corner on these things, uh, it's gotten easier and more enjoyable and less stressful for all of us. And what has it meant for you, Jack, as, as the business owner, as the, as the head farmer? It's meant, I think I've mentioned a couple times now, that I am out, you know, that I can go down to our field production coordinator any given day and say, hey, I've got an afternoon here. Do you need me to go out and, uh, and, and, and cultivate something? And he can just give me a work order right there, and I just go directly to the, to the 1710, or I go right onto the McCormick, and, and, and I know that the machine that I need is going to be out there, and it's going to be oiled and greased, and there's not a maintenance issue, and I can go out there, and I can be effective cultivating that job, the cultivating that crop or making those beds or whatever it is. It, it means that I can get back to the farming that I've loved in the first place that got me into this 25 years ago, and I can do it without a lot of, like we talked about, disturbance from phone calls from break, truck breakdowns and on Highway 52 or or um, issues with uh, with IRS auditors showing up at the door or whatever it is. I, I can I can get back to that thing that I love, and which is vegetable farming, with a lot less stress and just a lot more uh, in, just enjoyment all the way around, up and down the line. So, Jack, I, I don't think there's a better note for us to end on than that. So I think, I think we're going to turn to the lightning round here um, okay. and, and ask you, what's your favorite tool on the farm? The thing I enjoy most using is a rusty 50-year-old 10-foot grain drill. And uh, a lot of it is just uh, that time of year, uh, late summer, fall, planting cover crops. It's just such a satisfying job giving back in that way. I just, there's something about meditative about planting, uh, drilling cover crops that I enjoy using most. Um, but uh, that's so contextual in terms of the, the time of year and and uh, and, and the, the you know, cooler nights and other things. Uh, the thing I, I, I think is most successful tool in in our system and the thing that's the most biggest game changer for us is actually a homemade tool that we uh, built a, 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 an employee and I built about ten years ago, which is a three point mounted 
um, platform that we use for harvesting broccoli. And uh, it's a kind of a scaled down Salinas um, broccoli, um, a con, you know, convey, conveys, has wings that convey um, broccoli in from six rows into a central platform. It's got a compressor, the air compressor on, on the thing that, that allows us to run bunchers, pneumatic bunchers. Um, and we can have people packing broccoli on that on that uh, that harvest platform, and uh, back onto a high crop wagon that, that trails behind it. And you can go through a you know six row six six hundred foot rows of broccoli with this machine, and, and come out the other end with uh, you know 150 uh, cases of 18 pound bunch broccoli on the other end. And it's very 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 satisfying. Uh, again, fall operation around here September October. This is my favorite time of year uh, when it's cooler. And just seeing that 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 uh, the efficiency of it, and and just the the, the result, which is uh, well packed, um, you know, well cared for broccoli coming out the other end, very 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 satisfying. That so it's not okay. lightning. I should I should bet it myself, but I'd say that broccoli platform. So great. So we'll get some pictures of that, and and make sure that we've got at least something on the website to to provide some background and perspective. Uh, you can check the show notes for that. So, Jack, what's your favorite crop to grow? The carrots have become my favorite crop, I would say. Um, uh, there's something about that direct seeded thing um, going out there and the challenge of getting those things out of the ground in July. We grow storage carrots, seeded early July, um, heavily irrigated to get out of the ground. Uh, the satisfaction of pulling those things up, hidden out of that dark black ground in, in, in October, early November, that is my favorite crop. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing back in 2007, what would it be? Imagine what make a very clear inventory of what you think you can grow, what you think you can manage, the scale of the operation that you think is realistic. Be very, very, very realistic with yourself, uh, what you can manage, what you can really do, and then cut it in half, and that's what you ultimately can really get done. Jack, thank you so much. It's been really fun talking to you today, and I feel like you've provided a ton of value here in this episode. Well, thanks. It really, it's 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 really great to have a chance to reflect on some of these changes over the years and and uh, and and talk about them with the guy that helped put them into effect around here. And uh, so it's my pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jack. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode seventy-five of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast dot com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Hedin. That's H E D I N. If you value the podcast, we just launched some new ways that you can support the show at farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. First, you can become a patron of the show by setting up a monthly donation through Patreon, which is kind of like Kickstarter for ongoing projects. It's a great way to support the behind the scenes effort that you don't hear from research and scheduling to editing and getting the show online. Alternately, you can do a one time donation through PayPal, which would be awesome. Third, and here's something that comes at absolutely no cost to you. If you use the Amazon.com link on farmer to farmer podcast.com, Amazon kicks a percentage of what you spend back to the show, and it won't cost you a penny more. Again, go to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate for all of the relevant links. Thank you so much for your support. Since you're listening to the show, I'll bet you'd enjoy being on my email list, The Flying Rutabaga. You can buy, check that out at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. Your reviews and your referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to a growing circle of listeners. One more thing. I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions that I received through the suggestions form on farmer to farmer podcast.com. I read every single one of them. Please let me know who you would like to hear from, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs>